Hello, welcome to week five. When we left off, the framers were deciding to meet for the Constitutional Convention in 1787 in Philadelphia. As a quick reminder, Oh. They soon realized, however, that they were going to have to rewrite the entire Constitution. But where to begin? This week, we're going to see what they came up with. We're going to do this by comparing and contrasting the Virginia plan and New Jersey plan, summarize the major compromises that the delegates agreed to make and the effects of those compromises, and explore Article I of the U.S. Constitution, the legislative branch. The Congress... The biggest battle they faced was over the concept of representation. Who would have a say in our government? days, Edmund Randolph presented a plan written largely by James Madison. They were both from Virginia, hence the Virginia Under plan. Under the Virginia plan, there would be three separate branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. The legislator, or Congress, would be bicameral. Do you remember what we talked about last week? Bicameral, meaning two houses. Representation in each house was to be based either upon population or the amount of money that they gave to the central government. The members of the lower house, the House's representatives, were to be popularly elected. That means the people in the state would vote for them. And those of the upper house, the Senate, would be chosen by the House, nominated by state legislators. Under this plan, Congress would choose a national executive and a national judiciary. The plan set the agenda for much of the convention's work, but some of the delegates, namely those from the smaller states like Delaware, Maryland, and New Jersey, thought this, this, they thought that this plan was far too radical. Keep in mind, Virginia, authors of the Virginia plan, had one of the biggest states at the time, with nearly 700,000 people. With that being said, it may make sense that they thought that representation be, should be based on population. They had more people. Shouldn't they have more of a say in what goes on in their government? A few weeks after the Virginia plan was presented, William Patterson of New Jersey presented his own plan. Under the New Jersey plan, we would keep the unicameral legislature like under the Articles. In this Senate, each state would have the same amount of votes, no matter their size. If I've lost your interest because this is just someone talking about history, let me break it down with how it would work at CTEC. At CTEC right now, clinical care is our largest program. We have nearly 40 members of that program. On the other hand, culinary arts is one of our smallest. I think we only have a few over 10. Now, when it comes to choosing what we're going to have for lunch, we might expect that the culinary arts program should get to choose. After all, that's what they came here from. However, the clinical care students may argue, there's way more of us in this school than there are of you, and so shouldn't we have a bigger say on what sort of food we're being served every day? That's essentially the argument they were having in terms of representation in our government. Shouldn't the bigger states who have way more people have a bigger say in our government? While the smaller states or the smaller programs were saying, we're just as important and we should have an equal say no matter our size. Unfortunately, they couldn't come to an agreement, so they scrapped it all and went back to Great Britain. The end. Have a great day. Just kidding. Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut came through with the Connecticut Compromise. It was so great, we now refer to it as the Great Compromise. Under the Connecticut, or Great Compromise, we would have a three-branch government. We'd have a bicameral Congress with two houses. The House of Representatives would be based on population. This made Virginia and the big states happy. We'd also have a Senate. Under the Senate, each state would have two representatives. This made New Jersey and the small states happy. Both houses of Congress were required to pass any law. The Great Compromise made its way into the Constitution. Let's take a look at Article I. Article I of the U.S. Constitution outlines our legislative branch, the Congress, and Congress is made up of the House and the Senate. Now, to learn more about the House of Representatives and why you may be seeing Troy Balderson for Congress signs everywhere, you could go to your pocket and your phone and Google it, or you could look at your pocket constitution. Article 1, Section 2 tells us, The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states. What that means is every two years, every single member of the House of Representatives is up for re-election. This red and blue map actually shows us each congressional district in the United States. There are 435 of them. 
Each district represents between 700,000 and 1 million people, and each of those 700,000 to 1 million people have one person representing them in the U.S. Congress House of Representatives. The number 435 has been set since 1929, but obviously our population has grown. So how do we determine how many states get how many representatives in Congress? If you look at the map, Ohio gets 16 representatives. California gets 53. Montana, on the other hand, they only get one member in the House of Representatives. So how do they decide? Do they just draw numbers out of a hat? Nope, it's the census. And we're actually in the middle of one right now. Any census. Every 10 years, the census records everyone living in this country. It's written in the Constitution and comes in a questionnaire that counts everyone who lives at your address on April 1st. The data can be used to inform funding for services like fire stations, schools, clinics, and representation that affect your community. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. If your family hasn't filled out the paperwork yet, someone may come knocking on your door this fall. But please answer. These numbers are really important because like the video mentioned, not only is it federal funding for our fire and our police and our schools, but it also determines representation in Congress. Let's take a look at the current congressional map in Ohio. You'll notice the date at the top says 2012 to 2022. After the census this year, those numbers in those districts may change. And so a new map will be drawn. Most of you live in the 12th district in Ohio. Troy Balderson represents you. I personally live in Pickerington in Fairfield County, so my representative is Steve Stiers. Both gentlemen are up for re-election in November. Remember, every two years. Although they can serve as many terms as they'd like, and we do have members of Congress who have been serving since the late 70s, they do have to be re-elected every two years, so they spend much of their career campaigning. The pictures I'm showing now are actually of Troy Balderson visiting SeaTac last year, prior to the shutdown. Troy Balderson is considered the incumbent for the election this November. That means he's the current office holder running for re-election. He's a Republican, and he will be facing Democrat Elena Shearer in this election for Ohio's 12th district. Now, because they're able to be elected every two years, that also means they can be kicked out every two years. So they are meant to be the most representative of the people. And we have our duty as citizens to vote them in or vote them out if we're happy or unhappy with what they're doing. We're going to talk a little bit more about the powers of the House of Representatives next week, but today I want to talk about two unique powers that only the House has over the Senate. Those include all bills raising revenue must start with them, otherwise known as power of the purse. And the second one is the power of impeachment. All articles of impeachment must begin in the House of Representatives. Article 1, Section 7. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. This is pretty important because it means that any bill that raises taxes starts in the House. And if you know anything about America, you know that we care about taxes a lot. So this power is huge, and it's sometimes called the power of the... I think we're actually pretty close to considering impeachment. And it's starting to become uh, something akin to an impeachable offense. That would lead potentially to an impeachment. I will fight every day until he is impeached. President Trump's opponents, particularly Democrats, are starting to suggest he should be impeached for various offenses. But is that actually a possibility? Or is it just a pipe dream for those who say Trump should be out of office? For starters, the president doesn't actually need to commit a crime to be impeached. The Constitution says the House of Representatives can impeach the president, quote, for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. But how those high crimes and misdemeanors are defined is largely up to House members themselves. Essentially, the president has to do something bad enough that a majority of representatives vote to remove him from office. How would removing a president from office actually work? Let's break it down. Step one, the House votes to impeach. Step two, the Senate holds a trial. When the president is on trial, the chief justice of the Supreme Court presides. Step three, the Senate votes to convict. Impeachments have moved through those first two steps twice in American history. The first ever impeachment of a U.S. president came when Andrew Johnson was impeached in 1868 for violating the Tenure of Office Act, a law that required the president to get a Senate vote before dismissing any member of his cabinet. Richard Nixon never was impeached over the Watergate scandal. He resigned from office before an impeachment vote was ever held. In 1998, President Clinton was impeached for perjury and obstruction of justice as the Monica Lewinsky scandal played out. But neither Clinton nor Johnson was convicted by the Senate, meaning no U.S. president has ever been removed from office as the result of an impeachment. 
So the House of Representatives did bring charge against President Trump, and he was impeached. However, he was acquitted or found innocent in the Senate. Therefore, he was not removed from office. Two-thirds of the Senate would have needed to convict and remove in order for President Trump to have been removed from office, and that did not happen. But since we're on the topic, let's look at the Senate. All right, let's go back to the pocket constitution to look at the Senate. We're in Article 2, Section 3 now, if you want to follow along. It says, the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. Now, if you're following along, you may have noticed a little asterisk in there. And let me explain what that's from. When the Constitution was first written and ratified, the senators were actually chosen by the state legislators. So what that means is we the people would elect people in Ohio to serve for our government, and then the Ohio government would choose the senators. The 17th Amendment to the Constitution, however, changed that to direct election. So now I can go to the polls to vote for both my House of Representatives and my senators. In Ohio, we have two senators. Every state has two senators. So if every state has two senators, how many do we have in Congress? You're right, 100. Our two senators are Rob Portman and Sherrod Brown, and neither of them are up for re-election in 2020, but they do serve six-year terms. Like the House, they can run as, as many times as they'd like. Um, there's no limit to how many terms they serve, but they do serve six-year terms. We have about a third of the senators up for re-election every two years. That way, we don't get a brand new Senate every time we have an election. But we do get a brand new House every time we have an election. Sherrod Brown was first elected as Ohio's senator in 2006. He is up for re-election in 2024. Rob Portman was first elected to um, U.S. Senate representing Ohio in 2010, and he will be up for re-election in 2022. I've already mentioned one of the powers of the Senate and that they hold the trial for impeachment. However, another few powers that just the Senate holds is that they have the power to filibuster, they can ratify treaties, and they can approve or reject presidential nominees to the cabinet or to the Supreme Court. The power the Senate has is to ratify treaties. This requires a two-thirds vote of the Senate. Most treaties you don't hear much about, except when the Senate refuses to ratify them, as it did or didn't do with the Treaty of Versailles. I totally would have ratified that treaty. The last significant power that belongs only to the Senate is the confirmation power. The Senate votes to confirm the appointment of executive officers that require Senate confirmation. Some of these, like the cabinet secretaries, are obvious, but there are over 1,000 offices requiring Senate confirmation, including federal judges, and this is probably too many. Thank you. Until I am no longer able to stand. Most Americans could not give a flying flip about a bunch of politicians in Washington. Who cares? What the American people care about is their own lives. On a Saturday or Sunday morning when your dad's making pancakes, it is very cool when he can like flip them and make them, you know, make them do a flip high in the air and catch them. He also, I will, I will credit my father, he invented, this wasn't for the restaurant, but he did it anyway, he invented green eggs and ham. I don't believe there's been a day on this Senate floor that I haven't worn my argument boots. I took the coward's way out. And so went and purchased some, some black tennis shoes. I am not in my argument boots. And, and I'll confess, I, I really do feel embarrassed by that. Some people dismiss, oh, single payer, this is designed to go there. You know, that's just crazy tinfoil hat wearing stuff. You know, there's an old saying, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. If you will forgive me, I want to take the opportunity to read two bedtime stories to my girls. I do so like green eggs and ham. Thank you. Thank you. Sam, I am. Note folks in the gallery who just waved. I'm not sure if they have their, well, they do have their electronics. Well, if you tweet, it may end up here and I may have the chance to, to, to read it. I want to point out just a few words of wisdom from duck dynasty redneck rule number one most things can be fixed with duct tape extension cords i will say standing here after 14 hours standing on your own feet there's sometimes some pain sometimes some fatigue that is involved but you know what <laughs> there's far more pain that was pretty wild, right? That's actually Senator Ted Cruz filibustering, something that can only be done in the Senate. That filibuster was 21 the hours. The filibuster is a method of blocking vote on legislation that you disagree with. 
And in short, a member or members of Congress stand up and speak until they can't speak anymore. There are rules. You're not allowed to sit down. You're not allowed to use the restroom. You're not allowed to eat unless it's from a specific candy drawer. You're not allowed to drink. There has been word that one member wore a catheter so that they wouldn't have to use the restroom. The longest filibuster in history has been 24 hours and 13 minutes. So if we were to be in school under plan A and you were all here five days a week, we actually do a congressional simulation where one class is the House and the other class is the Senate. And we do elect a Speaker of the House. Um, we elect a president and a vice president, and we run through some of these procedures that you see happening in Congress. Unfortunately, right now, we're not going to be able to do that with this plan B. But if you join the Civic Simulations Club, that is something we intend on doing. The last part of Congress that I want to discuss today, because next week we'll get into some more specific powers, is how a bill becomes a law. And you know, there's just this guy that I've never been able to compete with in teaching this process. So take it away, Bill. You sure gotta climb a lot of steps to get to this Capitol building here in Washington. Well, I wonder who that sad little scrap of paper is. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the capital city. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday. At least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law passed, so they called their local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. And he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be alone. I hope and pray that they will, but today I am still just a bill. Listen to those congressmen arguing. Is all that discussion and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Oh, but it looks like I'm going to live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing starts all over again. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then I'm off to the White House where I'll wait in a line with a lot of other bills for the president to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be alone. How I hope and pray that he will. But today I am still just a bill. You mean even if the whole Congress says you should be allowed, the president can still say no? Yes, that's called a veto. If the president vetoes me, I have to go back to Congress and they vote on me again, and by that time you're so By old. that time, it's very unlikely that you become a law. It's not easy to become a law, is it? No. But how I hope and pray that I will, but today I am still just a bill. Besides your bill, now you're a law. Oh, yes! I swear that song will just never get old. All right, this week I have this Ed Puzzle, another Ed Puzzle tomorrow. These will both be due on Wednesday night, and we're talking about the legislative branch. Um, and then, as you've noticed, we've kind of gotten into this routine where Thursday I'm going to have a Google form or a critical thinking question. This week it is going to be a Google form with a short answer at the bottom, and that will be due Thursday night. And then on Friday, I really encourage you um, with your critical thinking questions, the slideshow one, or even the Google form last week, I do leave my um, comments to a lot of your responses. And so maybe take that time to go through your email, maybe, or Google Classroom, and try to find the comments that I left for you and reply to me. I also wanted to take a moment to apologize for the amount of emails you all are receiving. Um, one of you actually forwarded me one of the alerts that you were getting about my Ed Puzzle, um, because I just want you to know 
the teachers are not sending you all these emails. We just post our assignments and go about our business. But someone mentioned to me that they had completed an ad puzzle. I turned it back to them. And then they got an alert from Google Classroom and it said, Mrs. Griffin is asking you to turn this in. And I'm not. So I do apologize for your email. So maybe take Friday as that day to go through those emails and make sure you're not missing anything important. Make it a great week. Please reach out to me if you need any help. Um, I'm going to try to stop by a few more classrooms this week to meet some of you. And then also we're going to have our second uh, Civic Simulation Club meeting next Monday, the 28th. So I'm going to put a link to that classroom if you're interested. We had our first meeting last week and I thought it went really well. And I'm really excited to see what we're going to do this year. Bye.